My name is Brennan Washington. Uh, my wife and I own Bates Garden, two and a half acre small farm. We've been farming that piece of land for 10 years. Um, we do a variety of things. It's two acres. Um, we do veggies, fruits, and herbs. Uh, we do laying hens. We, twice a year, we do meat chickens. This year, for the first time, we do turkeys. Um, our animals are animal welfare approved. We were a CMG farm until last year, and we're looking to get our USDA certification now. Um, that's just a few pictures of what our farm looks like. I like sluggish chickens there. Um, uh, um, so the goals of the session is aimed at people wishing to earn an income from a limited growing area or how to make greater use of your growing space. So before I go any further, how many farmers in the room? New, okay. How many of the five in the one to five acres? Okay. Five to ten? Ten and above. Okay. All right. Do that. Less than one? Okay. That's, okay. That's fine. Okay. Um, okay. Good deal. Even if you have a larger farm, some of the things I'm talking about, you can um, incorporate into your farm. Um, so let's have that. Uh, income versus profitability. A lot of people get those things mixed up. You can make, you can make a ton of money. Um, you can grow a ton of money and have a lot of money coming to your front door, but not put any of it in your pocket. Uh, and you go broke. Uh, many things can affect profitability. Labor cost is a big one. Market characteristics. Um, you can be in the market. In Atlanta, you can get $8 a pound for heirloom tomatoes. Um, I bet you in some of your areas, they could probably lock you up in a crazy house if you have $8 So a lot of it, uh, what you can do in terms of income is dependent upon your market. Um, you're reinvesting your operation. You can have increases in production costs, um, or you can plan uh, to expand your farm. All of that will have an effect on your um, uh, profitability. Um, so, I always like to share real numbers. Um, you know, it's funny. You can talk to a farmer. You know, I, I spend a lot of time with farmers. Um, in addition to my work as a farmer, I sit on the board of Georgia Organics. I sit on the board of Southern SARE, which is the arm of the USDA that funds research and sustainable lag. We cover the 11 states in the southeast. I sit on the Georgia Food Policy Council. I've run Georgia Organics farmer training program for about three years now. And you can go and talk to a farmer, go on his farm and say, well, what kind of fertilizer do you do? Oh, I use Harmony. I use chicken litter. Um, really good stuff. Uh, how do you plow this? Well, I dis I discount this field before I do this. Um, before, before I do it, if you wanted to find out and and let me show you, just come on over. Farmers are like that. How much money did you make last year? Um, and if you want to see them really have spastic, that's asking how much do they keep in their pocket over the crop. They'll start twitching, and, and it's something that we don't talk about. Um, and, and 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 that's a little bit of a problem. So I'm going to talk about. It. Our best year, which is two years ago, um, on right around 3,000 square feet, we grossed $30,000. Um, right around $10 a square foot, which is what our goal was. Um, probably in our pocket, we probably grow, netted out about 10 or 15% of that. Um, but we were still in the window where the IRS was looking at us as a hobby farm. Um, and what I mean by that, you can show all the losses you want if you're a farm for five years. After that, the IRS starts, may start taking a look at you, saying you're just doing this, either shield income or doing anything else. One other question I forgot. How many of you are farmers, work off farm, have another job? Okay, and how many of you, the farm is your full-time income, or you're trying to be full-time income? Okay, that's gonna be important before we go back. Did anybody read this article that came out? It's been all over the internet. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's by farm, I don't remember where she was from, but basically saying that uh, small scale farming is a worthless endeavor. She can't make any money about it. it. She's going to tell people that she can't make any money about it. And she doesn't know what to tell students. And yada, 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 yada. And the first thing that struck me and a lot of people that I know is not so much what she said, but what she didn't say. She didn't say that she had a business plan and why she wasn't meeting. Um, her objectives in her business plan. She didn't tell what type of marketing she was doing. Um, she was leasing a farm. She didn't have any discussion of how those lease arrangements affected the profitability. It was just that, this is really hard work and I thought I was going to make a million dollars. 
Um, those of you who farm know that ain't the case. Um, but you can't make a living farming. You need to work smart, have a plan. You need to be willing to change um, when change demands that you change. So um, develop a business or farm plan. One of the most disappointing things a uh, farmer can tell me is that they don't know their cost of production. Um, they don't know how much it costs to grow a tomato or, or, or what their expenses are. It's even worse when they tell me, when I ask them how much are you paying myself, yourself, and they don't have an answer for me. Um, so a business plan helps you to crystallize your ideas. It doesn't have to be this complex document that you see, you have to, you see in these courses. It could be two sheets of paper. Um, when we set out our, our first original financial goals, it was very simple. I wish I said we sat down and had this great um, epiphany about what we're going to do. So my wife was at a job where she was going to get laid off, and we targeted our farm goals to replace the manager. It was that simple, and then we figured out what we needed to do. Um, so you can look at whatever works best for your situation, and, and but make a plan, even if it's two pages, this is what I'm going to do, this is how I'm going to do it. Make sure you uh, keep account for all your expenses and keep quality of life uh, needs in mind. You can go out, you can make a lot of money, um, you can gross a lot of money, you can keep a lot of money in your pocket, but at the end of the day, you're miserable or you're having family issues. Um, what happened after we owned that, we made that 30 grand, which is a really big milestone for us. We actually ramped up operations because we felt we could double it pretty easy. We actually leased out on the farm, then I had major back surgery down for two years. Um, so you need to factor in those type of things for when they happen. Um, I always tell farms that I work with, know your market. If you are planning, uh, planning to produce crops the market, you should have a good understanding of the market that you sell to. But let's go back to our, our tomato example. Um, we're in Lawrenceville, Georgia, which is about 30 minutes north of Atlanta. Um, fairly suburban area. Um, fairly affluent, um, as this pockets probably fairly affluent, not as the markets aren't as um, the clientele isn't as wealthy as what you see in some of the Atlanta markets, but they do okay. So we probably got five or six dollars a pound for really good heirloom tomatoes. Ten minutes south, uh, ten minutes south, we went to wait, no, ten minutes north, we did a market up in Barrow County, Auburn. Um, not only could we get five dollars a pound for tomatoes? They didn't want heirloom tomatoes. They want they wanted red tomatoes, yellow squash, okra, field peas. You didn't have that, they looked like some kind of weirdo. So, so once again, tailored to your market. That's the stuff you want to grow, then you need to find a market that you're gonna uh, be able to sell that stuff. Um, a good farm plan will have a diversified stream of income. So uh, and by that I mean two things. You'll have revenue sources from different streams, and you're selling different products off your farm. So we do eggs, we do meat chickens, we do uh, um, vegetables. We also started to combine things. We used to do, and this is by accident, we were growing some wheatgrass as a cover crop. And somebody said, what's that there? And it's wheat. And we had some dandelion, we ended up selling juice sponges right. for $6. Um, uh, but have that diversified. You always hear the term value added. Everybody know what value added products are? Yep, yep, Rusty, raise your hand. Yep, <coughs> Rusty does some really good value added products. You basically take a strawberry to turn it into strawberry jam. You, you're take, well, you're doing two things. You're getting a higher value for that product, but more importantly, you're probably using stuff that you couldn't take to the market because of blemishes or other things, you're finding a, a use for that. Don't throw that stuff out. Um, and also wholesale is becoming a more important market for our small farmers. Um, so start at the end, plan plan for your market. Before you, as you're preparing your land, find out what, what's being sold in your community, What's and more importantly, what's not being sold. What happens? <laughs> Did I do something? Yeah. No. I thought people started asking questions already. Did it go up? I was talking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
why you're a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> non-acidified foods in your home kitchen if you were selling at a farmer's market or church or some type of nonprofit and your sales went to $500. Uh, that has since changed. There is now a law called the uh, Georgia <coughs> School College School Law, um, which widens the variety of stuff that you can do at home. Um, like I know people doing herb blends and that type of stuff in your house. They do come and do an inspection. Um, and I know that I know there's a few farms here who have gotten. Rusty, do you have that? Do you guys get parts of anything on the uh, cottage food law? Amy handles all that. Okay. We, we have not been inspected. But okay. What we did learn yesterday in the food safety class okay. right. was there's going to be changes in uh -huh. jams and jellies. You're going to have to register with the FDA. Yeah. Does someone hit your church? I know. It's farmers work. Well, uh, well, yeah. I mean, basically, basically. Um, you may not be inspected, but you got to be registered. You're on the screen. That's what okay. Supports. The big thing are acidified foods. No salsas, no tomato sauces, no soups, no canned vegetables. All that's a no 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 in a home kitchen. Um, fermented foods, even though a lot of us are probably uh, proponents of fermented foods in. Uh, uh, fermented foods, um, really, you have to go to something called pickle school. Um, you know, like, uh, yeah, UGA has a pickle school, and it's $600. Um, uh, it's part of the problem. Um, uh, and we'll talk more about uh, There we go. All right. Thank you. CSA, is everybody familiar with the concept of CSAs? CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. A typical model is a customer pays you for X amount of weeks. Let's say it's a 10 week season, you charge $25 a week, and they will get the benefits of the produce coming off the farm. You usually give them a box or a bag of food, anywhere from 8 to 10 items, um, and they pick that up weekly. Uh, farmers love this. Is that a, part, a major part of your operation? It was. We're, we're changing our operation, but we have done off of this farm up to what, 70? When? Yeah. Yeah, 70, 75 person CSA. CSA or about 75 acre. Now, we had to bring some stuff in like corn and stuff that we didn't have the land mass to really build that people were expecting. But mostly came off of that stuff. So. Um, farmers love CSA because you get your money in front. All right? So if you're doing a 10 week CSA at uh, $25 a week and you got 10 customers, you're getting $2,500 in front. Um, the flip side of that, you better know what you're doing because um, all the farmers will, send, will sign a contract saying that they'll share in the risk in the farm. So you're growing and we have cross or a couple of years ago, we had those really bad late rains. The customers agreed to share in that risk. Um, but you can't go to a customer and say, well, I didn't know I was supposed to plant my tomatoes this time, so I don't really have it. So um, the farmer error can't be included in it. Um, 
<laughs> online markets are becoming very, very, very popular. Basically, it's like an online farmer's market. You list your stuff online, locally grown, those even, especially from the Athens area. But there's Athens locally grown, but they're all over the state and country. Um, but you the farmer just basically lists their stuff online. Um, at whenever they're going to open a market for the customers to pick up, they send you a list of what you have, uh, what your orders are. You print out your labels, you bag it up, you take it there, they give you a check. Um, as compared to farmers markets, you're a really good training ground, but you blow out a lot of time at farmers markets. You do. Um, you got harvesting. You've got the day at the market, and if you have a small operation like we do, that's time away from the farm. Um, we did up to five markets a week, uh, and we actually backing off. Of um, and restaurants and retail. Uh, use your available resources if you're a farmer. Um, I do a lot of advocacy work, and um, I can understand why farmers say that they don't want to take government money, but it disappoints me sometimes because sustainable farmers basically get crumbs off the ag department of ag table, um, and programs like NRCS, cooperative extension. Are there for you? I look at it this way. That's your tax dollars for the back. Make it work for you. Um, NRCS does course shares, and I'm sure a lot of you are setting the NRCS things. Uh, courses that they may even have a roof here, I'm not sure. They'll pay for stuff like wells, micro irrigation. If you do, anybody here livestock farmers? Got animals? Okay. They'll pay for interior fencing, these new paddocks. They'll pay for composting systems. They'll pay for roof runoff systems. Um, uh, one of the best things that NRCS does doesn't even involve money. They will come out and walk your land with you and show you where you need to address resource concerns. Um, they'll do that for free. Your tax dollars have already paid for that. Cooperative extension is another one. Just get in the habit of using these resources. Um, and between these agencies like these and farmers that have been in the game for a while, you don't need to sit make the same mistakes that we've made. We've made them for you. Um, uh, yes. Uh, the question is, does NRCS look at it in a sustainable way? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Now, <clears throat> we've got to teach them a little bit. I actually, I'm, don't tell anybody this, but I'm a spy. I actually took a little part-time job at NRCS. So I'm behind the lines for you guys. That's a wonderful <laughs> <laughs> um, But I actually, I, mean, I found out about practices I had no clue existed. Um, that a lot of the USDA, we just got to change mine. But they're changing. But they'll do stuff like cover crops. Right. They'll pay stuff like cover crop seed. Now I only pay two dollars an acre uh, because they don't understand the value of cover crops. Where Sarah nationally has this big push for cover crops. So one hand's not really talking to the other, but we'll get them. So, um, labor. How many of you hire people? No. One. So that means you don't go one, two, that, that was three, four. That means all the rest of you doing the work yourself, right? <laughs> labor is your biggest budget cost. Um, uh, the one time that we actually hired somebody was probably the worst mistake we ever made. Um, in addition to not getting the work out of the guy, three months after he left, we stuff that we really wouldn't. I went to go look for this really expensive box of fishing reels. Gone. Um, uh, um, so uh, I saw a guy speak at Southern Saw last week, and some of the things that he said is develop the labor systems on his farm and use them. That means working smart, you know, make sure you have all your tools together, um, invest in high quality tools. My, my wife tells me this all the time, you know, just buy some, you're a farmer, not a, um, not a gardener anymore. Buy tools that are last and going to make you work, that's an investment, plus you can write them off. Um, use good volunteers and interns we can get when you get them. We used to do a, what, some of our CSA shares we used to save as work share. Basically, instead of you paying us that $25, you agreed to come over and give us uh, three hours of work, three or four hours of work. Um, a week. Sometimes we got, yeah, a week. Sometimes we got good people, sometimes we didn't. Um, but we got really, really uh, two good people that we come on to. And they just do it now because they like it. Um, and they come over, actually, um, uh, I'll show you this is a that's a, one of our sons that's us putting on high tone. But this guy's a retired uh, Delta employee. Just has nothing to do, and he uh, he comes over and helps us with farming once a week. And um, uh, and then we make sure we broaden. We 
when we went to Turkey this year, we gave him Thanksgiving turkey. If my wife can't come to me on a conference and I know I've got an extra ticket, he, he, he comes with me. So we reward those workers. Um, and if you do hire somebody, make sure you have well-documented uh, procedures and processes. Because there's nothing like having to explain something to somebody 20 times, you know? Um, uh, especially when you're in the heat of things like harvesting. And so you really want to have those procedures written down so people know what to do with them. Um, that's my other son. We, we, we're doing um, we're doing a lot of renovation on our farm, so we're trenching our main line. And uh, this person right there in the high tone, she actually thinks she's the wall. <laughs> she, she just comes down and looks around, and makes faces at us, and uh, uh, and goes on. Um, a key to your farm. How many of you new farmers? Okay. Design your space. Take the time to take a pencil, paper, walk your property, and design what your production space is going to be like. Are you going to have in-ground beds? Are you going to have raised beds? Are you going to put stuff in containers, which is good. Um, determine what season you can go through. We're blessed here. Now, we really have three seasons. We've got a short spring, uh, a long summer, and then we've got a fall winter season. Make sure you have some revenue goals. We break everything down by the square foot on our farm. Um, typically, it's done by the acre. We do everything by the square foot. So our minimum revenue uh, goal for anything that we do is ten dollars a square foot, and we don't really want to put more than five dollars a square foot in labor and uh, production costs into that bed. Sometimes we go up with that, sometimes we don't. Um, sometimes we can't. But we've been we've been right around the five six dollar mark with production costs, um, and we think we can get that down a lot more. Um, most of you might, uh, I won't belabor on this, make sure you have good sunlight, make sure you have access to water. Um, uh, if you have trees, don't be in a hurry to cut them down. And if you have slopes, how many of you have areas where you have to really, really deal with slopes? We do, we're in Georgia, so that's an issue. Um, your soil is your most important thing uh, on your farm. Uh, be loyal to the soil. Um, actually, you should think of yourself not as farmers, but as caretakers of the soil and the vegetables and the income that comes from that vegetable most crops as a result of that labor. Um, if you keep that in mind, um, uh, you'll have a pretty good farm. Um, but get soil tests, build and maintain your, your soil, and there's a lot of people here giving uh, courses about that, but it should be an ongoing exercise. Um, we do composting, we do cover crops, uh, we do some no-till and sheet composting, and we let some animals graze over some of our properties. We try and build a little integrated system as much as we can. Um, basically, most of it, we do all raised beds, basically, well, I'm gonna talk about slopes in a minute, but we do mostly raised beds because of the nature of our geography. Um, but I also think raised beds have tremendous benefits to them. Um, but we built a lot of our beds using the sheet composting method, where we're just basically layering organic matter and um, that's how we built uh, soil vitality on our, on our farm. Um, um, we also use animal manures. We're too small to have things like cattle, uh, but we do do chickens, we do do uh, uh, both broilers and laying hens, and like I said, we did turkeys for this year. This year, We have brought in stuff like uh, horse manure um, from other farmers. Be careful with stuff like horse manure. Um, because if it's not a sustainable or uh, organic farm, they sometimes spray a herbicide called Grazon, and if that stuff's in your thing, uh, it will kill your plants. Um, so it's really important to know if you're sourcing organic materials, where you're getting them from and what those people did to it. Um, but that's a little chicken tractor we built to get on top of our beds. Um, trees, don't be in a, a hurry. Our place was covered with trees, and not only were they trees, there were trees that were infested with pine needles, so we oh. stand and talk in a 60 foot pine and fall down. Oh. So, um, my son and I actually tried to be lumberjacks for all of about half a day. <laughs> <laughs> we got a chainsaw cut in the tree, and then I, we brought in some help. But, um, uh, see, trees is a resource on your property. Um, if, they, if, if you do have to get rid of them, you can use it. Uh, that those remains with wood chippings and mulch. And that, as much organic material that you can get on your property, reuse that stuff. Um, that's the name of the game. Um, the other thing is, trees provide a lot of good productive area. A lot of people don't know that. Um, they give a lot of shade. So ginger, we grew some ginger for the first time. So we're ex experimenting with niche crops. We planted it out in, in one of our main beds where we got direct sun. It just did not like that 100 degree 
Georgia heat in the middle of the summer. It just didn't like it. It just burnt right up. We tucked it in among, we've got uh, a, a strip of trees going down the side of the property. We tucked them all in the pots this year, and they did excellent. Uh, still not at the yields that we wanted, but we really got them to grow. We were able to get rise on that a bit. And that's space that probably we wouldn't have done anything with. Um, there's an ongoing thing now, I don't think Lynn Pugh's here at the conference, with medicinal herbs, uh, golden seal, ginseng, all grown woodlots. Um, so when you're thinking about your farm plant, think about how what you may think is an uh, unproductive space can become a productive space. Um, the other thing about things like ginseng when you're planting your farm plant, the more diversified your farm is, the more labor you uh, gonna have to uh, put into it. So running, I told you we did a 70 person CSA. So that means we had to grow several different varieties of tomatoes, 10 different types of vegetables. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of uh, work. Something like ginger, you plant once, um, give it a little bit of attention, then you're done, you know, um, until, until it's time to harvest. So keep that in mind, especially if you're working. If you're working too, if you want to get set on the path to profitability, keep your job. <laughs> no, I, I'm being serious. Do, do not make the mistake of jumping out and saying, well, I, I can do this, which is what I think that girl in the article do. Let the farm make some mistakes while you've got some backup. You know, yeah. um, that's what we did. Now, treat it like a business from day one. Our mistake was we didn't do that, and if we did make a mistake, we would paper it up with income from our job, which probably hurt us in the long run. Um, so treat it like a business, set up separate books and stuff like that. But keep your job and just, you know, it's a nice part-time income, uh, and, and then when you see you can make the jump, if, the, if your income goals are where you need to be, you want to make the jump, then you've got that experience going. Um, I'm going the way. Uh, I'm going on time. Sorry, I was so changed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get back to you in two seconds. Slopes. We got a lot of slopes that we have to deal with. Um, you can see here, this is a... Uh, that's the downward looking at our thing. So that's that's our farm. The house sits at the top of the hill, and we just have slopes. Um, first year that we planted, we cultivated all that land, and we had some heavy rains like we had the other day. And underneath that is pretty much bedrock and granite. Um, really, really. It's not, I wish I had Georgia clay, but I don't. You can do something with clay. You really can't do anything with a rock. Um, so that water would hit that hillside. And the first year we planted, we had some pretty expensive seed, washed it all into the woods. Um, uh, so we started looking at what we can do to, uh, one, minimize the damage that we get to slopes, and then two, turn that, you see that's a lot of land now. Um, how can we change that into a productive area? Um, so we did a couple of things. Didn't we tried this one year, we just basically laid out some landscape cloths and filled some bags with dirt, amended it, and we actually got melon, European melons, um, squash, and I think that was it. We just did squash and European melons on that hillside. But that's a hillside that we didn't have. Now, junction course going into that really